So, having outlined sort of this view on private property and its relationship to humanity and the views of the political economists, Marx next turns to the question of communism in relation to private property. And here he begins to develop an explicitly dialectical analysis of private property. He acknowledges that the political economists have come to understand private property as an expression of labor, but he points out that they don't understand the contradictions within the relations of private property between labor and property itself. Marx explains that, quote, the antithesis between lack of property and property is in fact the antithesis between labor and capital, end quote. So private property within it contains the seeds of the contradiction that we recognize in capitalism between those who own private property and those who sell their labors uh, to those who do own private property. So the antithesis of these two forces is established through the regime of private property. Let's take a second and assess exactly what this means, because this language is all somewhat complex. Under the regime of private property, those who do not own private property, i.e. the workers, must sell their labor in exchange for wage, whereas those who own private property are spared from labor and instead work towards the accumulation of capital. In this sense, private property itself necessarily establishes this contradiction as its own internal relationship. This is built into capitalist social relations. In response to this failure to fully understand and grasp this contradiction, political economists have failed to truly understand what exactly is wrong with private property. Marx criticizes Proudhon for placing the blame on, quote, capital as such, rather than on property, and notes that utopian socialists like Fourier and Saint-Simon locate specific forms of labor as the key problem. In contrast to these limited views, Marx turns to analysis of communism, looking at three potential forms of communism in order to figure out what the correct form would be. The first type of communism that Marx analyzes is what he calls a crude communism, which seeks a universalization of private property rather than an abolition of it. This crude communism is merely, quote, a generalization and consummation of private property, end quote, and wants to bring everything possible under the domain of private property while throwing out anything that does not fit under this domain, such as individual notions of personality and talent. The condition which produces the workers in relation to property are not undone, but are rather universalized as private property becomes a universal reality. This form of communism, Marx asserts, is merely a form of envy for the possessions of the capitalist class, rather than a resolution to the contradiction imposed by the regime of property. This form of communism, by leaving private property intact, assures only a weak egalitarianism, wherein all that is assured is, quote, the equality of wages paid out by communal capitalism, by the community as the universal capitalist, end quote. Quote. As such, this crude communism is not a break from private property itself, but an expression of it. All it can do is create a crude leveling and form of egalitarianism, and can never actually rupture capitalism and resolve the contradiction that private property imposes. Marx very briefly then describes a second form of communism as containing the, quote, abolition of the state, yet still incomplete and being still affected by private property, i.e. by the estrangement of man, end quote. In the second form of communism, there's a move to free mankind from the estrangement of capitalism, but the way that this estrangement is produced through private property is still not yet understood, keeping this time of communism bound by the regime of private property as well. So, having outlined these two sort of incorrect understandings of communism, Marx finally describes a third form of communism. We must quote this description at length. He refers to this communism as, quote, the positive transcendence of private property as human self-estrangement, and therefore as the real appropriation of human essence by and for man. Communism, therefore, as the complete return of man to himself as a social being, a return accomplished consciously and embracing the entire wealth of the previous development. This communism is as fully developed naturalism equals humanism, and as fully developed humanism equals naturalism. It is the genuine resolution of the conflict between man and nature and between man and man. The true resolution of strife between existence and essence, between objectification and self-confirmation, between freedom and necessity, between the individual and the species. Communism is the riddle of history solved, and it knows itself to be the solution." End quote. This communism doesn't ground itself in some sort of reactionary return to older forms of life before capitalism, nor does it seek historical examples of its existence like crude communism does. Rather, it understands itself as emerging as a process of historical development. There's no attempt to return to a time before private property, but rather recognition that private property has illuminated the material reality of humankind's life in relation to production. As a result of this materialist focus, it recognizes that, quote, religion, family, state, law, morality, science, art, etc. are only particular modes of production and fall under its general law, end quote. 
Given this realization, this third form of communism grasps that freedom from religious estrangement is not enough because it's a freedom which only happens at the level of consciousness. Whereas freedom from economic estrangement happens at the level of material reality. In this sense, Marx goes beyond the young Hegelians who had a critique of religion from an atheistic perspective as their critique of society to a materialist criticism that looks at the material base of reality as well as the ideological superstructure. As such, this communism embraces an atheistic perspective in advocated by many critics of Marx's time, but it moves beyond that atheistic perspective, recognizing that material rather than abstract philosophical estrangement must be combated and that such estrangement arises from particular material conditions. Not only does this understanding of communism reorient from an abstract philosophical ideal to an economic and material reality, it also takes shape as a specifically human reality. In this text, we see Marx's humanism come out very strongly. This materialist conception of communism, understood through an economic account of private property, grants insight into mankind's own identity and the relationship between humans as individuals and humans as species. Marx writes that, quote, We have seen how, on the assumption of positively annulled private property, man produces man, himself and the other man, how the object, being the direct manifestation of his individuality, is simultaneously his own existence for the other man, the existence of the other man, and that existence for him. End quote.